Yep, it looks like we're live. <laughs> I think we are live, yeah. Yes. Okay, well, hello, everyone. Uh, hopefully, you're here with us live. We're live. I'm live anyways. The last <laughs> I time I checked. Oh, <laughs> Uh, I'm Mitzi Soretto, and um, I'd like to welcome you back to Facebook Live with me. Um, and this is actually the first uh, Facebook Live for uh, my new book release, which is pretty much hot off the press. Uh, the Best New True Crime Stories, Partners in Crime. And I am joined today from sunny Southern California, which I think is boiling Southern it's California, boiling. Uh, <laughs> by Joan Renner. Hi, Joan. Hi. Got your got car conditioning on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a, when the air starts getting that nice, thick, chewy quality again, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I well yeah. remember that from my LA days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Well, I'm so glad you're um, able to join me today. Um, oh, and uh, this is actually your first story for, for uh, my series. So I'm really excited yes. about that. And um, so. just to kind of just to say, actually, it's not your last story either, because I've got you for two more books. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so anyways, how, how are you doing? Are you, you're keeping busy and keeping out of mischief? Well, keeping busy. <laughs> not out of mischief. The no. mischief is sometimes yes, yeah, sometimes no, but Mostly, mostly, but definitely busy. Yeah, always. Yeah. Well, well, true crime writers are too busy writing about true crime to get into any mischief. Well, yeah, that and I'm, I'm really kind of a failed felon. You know, I mean, I know how crimes are committed, but I also know a lot of cops and I know you don't get away with it. So <laughs> this, yeah, is yeah. Some, this is sort of a really good like sublimation for me. I can write about other people's crimes and commit murder in my head a few times a day, but never actually have to do the time. So I'm good with that. God, I feel a bit left out now. I'm not committing murder in my head several times a day. I don't, maybe uh, maybe a couple of times a week is about my limit. Oh, no, I, there's a lot, there's there, there's a lot to, yeah. Oh, you know, you're right. You're right. Now that I think about it, yeah, I do have a list. <laughs> I've always got a list. And even if I don't, it could just be that random person at the store who made me angry. You know, and I, I'm, I'm planning a, a horrible death for them. And the good thing is, is that it always kind of makes me laugh at myself. And I, I would never do anything. I mean, to me, shouting is violence. I can't, I don't even, I can't take that. I can't, I don't like it. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, well, yeah. You don't want to end up shouting at anyone these days because you'll end no. up in a true crime story as the victim. No, 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 no. I know, no. I'm always smiling and pleasant. I had my first ever encounter with um with one of uh, the homeless people in downtown LA. I volunteer for the LA Sheriff's Department, and I was walking back from the Hall of Justice uh, over to Union Station, and there's um there's several homeless encampments on the way. And usually it, it's not a big deal. I mean, you know, everybody, they just doing what they do and it's okay. But um, the other day I, I was, and I had my laptop with me and I had it in one of those little rolling bags for it, you know? And uh, the woman came from one of the tents and she came up on me fast and I wasn't sure if she was just gonna panhandle or what. The next thing I knew she had a, a grip on one of the handles from my, from my bag and yeah. I thought, uh oh, and I could just see the, there was just crazy in her eyes, you know, and I thought, okay, well, I wonder how this is going to go. <laughs> I haven't punched anyone since I was a teenager, and I didn't really want to escalate anything. So I just thought, okay, let's see her how she plays it out, you know, and then I can decide my next move. And uh, she was saying words, but not sentences. So I, I knew, you know, I knew she had a problem. And so I thought, okay, you know, we'll just see. And and she kept saying words and I couldn't make any sense. I knew the words, but not what she was trying to tell me. And it was an accusatory tone. So I knew she was blaming me for something, but I wasn't sure what. And then she said, she just looked at me and she said, you don't care. And I thought, well, here's my opportunity. And I said, I care. And she froze for a moment. And then she released my bag and she, walked off muttering, still in that same angry tone, but not, you know, and then I just thought, okay, let's go to the station. So wow, that was the weirdest. I mean, I've never had that happen before. I've, 
I've been going downtown for years and you know, I mean, never just never had that happen. It was really startling to me, you know, and I knew it wasn't her fault. She she probably needs to be on medication that she can't get. And so yeah. it's not really her fault, but it wouldn't make me or my family any happier if she beat me over the head with something. So yeah. it's a yeah. tricky situation. But yeah, true crime is all around us. Well, that was a lucky escape, I think. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, do. I was just glad. I just thought, no, we don't want this to escalate. I don't want her to be hurt. I don't want me to be hurt, you know. So we'll just wing it. See, this is the fun part, since you're, you 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 seem to have a love of historical true crime, which brings <laughs> us to your story in the book, um, yeah. which is uh, The Wages of Sin, The Ballad of Margie and Dale. Yeah. Uh, and this is a period piece. And um, I wanted to ask you, because um, these people, I guess the closest that we can just say is is to, for people's frames of reference would be Bonnie and Clyde. Oh. And, and I wonder why Margie and Dale don't seem to have the notoriety and the fame of Bonnie and Clyde. Do you have any ideas about that? I do. I think it's just the period in which they committed their crimes. Um, the 1930s was a whole separate era and the FBI was then active. There really wasn't anything like that. You know, not everything was just in its infancy when they were committing their crimes. They could cross the state line and pretty much be done and gone. And by the 1930s, you have, you know, J. Edgar Hoover, who's really trying to make a name for himself. And that's when you start seeing, you know, 10 Most Wanted. And it's not just a local thing. It's a national thing. And you also have the um, like when they were committing their crimes, they didn't even have the talking films were still almost a decade in the future. But in the in the 30s, you had those newsreels. So, you know, if you went to see a picture, you'd get the newsreel. Oh, Bonnie and Clyde or, you know, Babyface Nelson, you get all that. So they, they were just sort of um, of their time period. If that what it was covered, they were covered in the newspapers wherever they committed crimes, if they had their actual, if they had their names or they knew who they were, but they didn't have that kind of notoriety because the technology hadn't caught up with the kinds of crimes they were committing to make them famous or infamous. Bonnie and Clyde are a whole different, you know, a whole different deal. But Dale and Margie definitely would have been, they, yeah, they, yeah. If the, if the technology had been there, they would have been all over it because they really loved the spotlight, the two of them did. They did. Yeah, yeah, that comes through in the story. Uh, I mean, if, if, if it can, is it even comparable to say which, which, partnership was worse on a scale of one to ten I mean, gosh i i think i think margie and dale in some ways because they were they they did and and could commit crimes separately bonnie and clyde were kind of they were a bonded pair and they seemed to act as as a couple as a pair um, Dale and Margie did too, but they didn't really need each other to commit crimes. Um, Margie was certainly capable of committing a crime on her own. And so I think that's the difference. And I think that's what makes them worse. So both of them, you have these two ticking time bombs. And when you put them together, you have a nuclear explosion because that's just their personalities. And Bonnie and Clyde really, you know, they had, they had the love affair and everything. And they were just that bonded couple. Dale and Margie, I think, love, maybe, I, I think it, they were uh, companions of convenience for each other. I'm not sure how deep it went, and I'm not sure how deep they were capable of. They were both uh, drug addicts for a lot of their time together, if not all of their time together. And so they had, they were serving another master. They're serving their addiction. Bonnie and Clyde were serving whatever they thought their love was. Yeah. <sighs> Oh, that's interesting. I mean, one, one doesn't think of these period crimes as necessarily <laughs> like people doing drugs and whatnot. It's, it's, oh. we all think that's more of a contemporary issue. No, they could get, believe me, they could get better drugs than you could get now. Uh, they were, get, they were getting, they were getting, you know, like morphine and stuff. I mean, and, and things like that. Opium was uh, pretty much, you know, was all over the place in, in the 1910s. And I mean, when was the last time you heard about an opium bust? Not really. You only hear about the process stuff, heroin, you know. So they, they were, yeah, they were getting some really heavy duty drugs. And you, you became an addict 
pretty quickly if you especially if you were predisposed and i think they both were hmm. interesting yeah. interesting um give us an idea we you said that about the time frame uh so we're talking early 20th century um yes. these these two were quite um they moved around a lot didn't they 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 hit they a lot did. of different areas they did they moved they were in the midwest i mean i but margie uh started out in in southern california in la but um dale started out in the midwest he 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 started as a kid i mean he was just he was just like one of those you know bad seeds he started <laughs> as a kid and he was he and a, and a, a companion were stealing goods to order from trains and so then and then would sell them they'd sell them at auctions they'd sell them to specific buyers for their goods and he was maybe under 12 when he's doing this wow. so he was pretty criminally sophisticated by the time he even got into his teens and he ended up in la and um he had a baby face in fact uh, i think truth be told i think dale is a bit of a cross dresser on occasion and he could he could he could clean up pretty well and i think that um he, he had, but he had this baby face he looked innocent as all get out and so he came to la and they just couldn't believe that this baby faced boy was committing these crimes and they they referred to him at first as the mystery youth they weren't sure where he came from he wasn't giving them any specifics about his background who his people were you know he was playing it tight and so they just called him the mystery youth and they they tried there were a couple people who really invested in trying to help him and he was a lost cause and he traveled he traveled he you know they killed law enforcement they killed a sheriff in colorado uh he was all over the place he, he had a gang you know and they just they if they couldn't they seemed to be fond of big events so if they could if they could get away without a shootout eh, if they could get away during a shootout even better they seem to have they seem to be big time adrenaline junkies you know not yeah, just you know, not just addicted to drugs but the adrenaline of the of the, 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 the rush yeah the rush you know it's interesting you make a point about how they they couldn't find out who dale was i mean can you imagine living in an era where there isn't like a ton of ton of information available on everything from from you know um your your fingerprint to blood type <laughs> to you know uh, where you ate dinner last night i mean i grew up in a time when you had to be there to answer the phone so i can kind of imagine it you know <laughs> but uh, and I kind of like that. I like the I like the random aspect of it. You know, like if you were, I always have this sort of fatalistic attitude toward it. If if you were there to answer the phone and you were meant to get that call, you were home. Otherwise, eh. But now they can get you and you're in the bathroom. And I, yeah. I, I'm not I'm not a fan. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a little much. You kind yeah, kind of hark like into those days. Way too much people and way too much time. And I just I like the whole thing where you know. You were either there or you weren't there, you know, and you, but we got along just fine. Somehow we managed to, you know, use the oh. map instead of, you know, geo stuff and well, it's just imagine being a criminal and 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 basically playing a guessing game about who you are, where you're from, et cetera, et cetera. That would just be unheard of today. Yeah. Well he could, I yeah. mean, he and he was he was a pretty decent liar. And he seemed to he seemed to enjoy it, you know, because he really was he really was a bad seed. I mean, I, there's uh, redeeming qualities. He liked dogs. So did Hitler. That's uh, at least I that's I approve of him. He's he's gone up in my estimation. He did like that. that. They did they did get a puppy when when you know when he and 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 Margie were out here and they rented a house and they got a puppy. I don't know what strange domestic fantasy they were playing out <laughs> it quickly it quickly deteriorated into the same old nonsense you know crime drugs the same stuff that's who they were that's just yeah. and that's why they that's why they died so young you know but yeah. they had they had a lot of they had a lot of past for two people you know barely breaking out of their teens they had a lot of past yeah, it certainly sounds like it. Um, you mentioned about uh, stealing stuff off of trains and then reselling it. What other types of crimes were they involved with? Oh, just about anything they could get their hands on. Lots of thefts. 
uh, robberies of all different kinds. Um, they committed, gosh, I mean, you name it, murders, not murders for profit. These were mostly murders because they were, they felt trapped. And yeah. if there was a law enforcement person there or somebody else was there, they would kill, you know, to, to, uh, to get out of the situation. But, um, no, they, they ran the gamut from petty crimes to capital crimes. No, and you, you mentioned bank robberies too, in this story, bank right? They robbery. were doing some LA yeah, bank Dale, robberies. Yeah. Dale did time in prison and he may have done time under an alias. Even now <laughs> with our access to records and things, it's not, he's not always an easy person to track because he, he changed locations. He changed his name to suit, you know, whatever he had in mind that day. And so he, he's a tough character to find even today. And then, like you said, it was really hard. You had to sort of accept what he told you is the truth. And even though people would, you know, at some point they realized he was lying. They, what they had to, you know, they only had what he told them to go on. And there was only just so much of that thread they could pull. Can but, you yeah, imagine he, being arrested today and just saying like, hi, you know, my name is, you know, Mary Smith and I'm from Oshkosh <laughs> and like, yeah. they, they have to take that as true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who are you? Um, yeah, I know that they, they'd have you so fast. I mean, they were, they were arrested for auto theft. Um, they were arrested for um, lots of auto thefts because auto was a good thing to steal. If you were stealing cars, that was, that was a good because you could, you know, not everyone knew how to drive a car in those days. They just didn't because not everybody owned a car. And yeah. so, um, cause this is early, this is 1910s. Um, by 1915, Los Angeles, I think had more cars here than any other city in the, in the, in the union, but that's no surprise to people who lived in LA, yeah. but, um, but he was taken in with a, with a male companion, with a, with another, with a friend, he was taken into custody for, um, for auto theft. Uh, the friend helped him make an es escape from a train. Uh, it, the, the list, the, just a litany of, of crimes, you know, um, uh, a murder of a constable in Missouri. And this is even before he hooked up with, uh, with, with Margie. And so uh, he was just, he was just all over the place committing these horrible crimes. But again, auto theft was really big. He knew how to drive. He liked to drive. And that's another similarity between, um, between Dale and Clyde Barrow. Clyde Barrow loved cars. He loved cars and he loved guns. And I think they share that, that love. Um, unfortunately for everyone, uh, there weren't any Thompson uh, submachine guns available for him. Cause they, they tried to, they tried for, for Dale, they tried to, um, they, they were meant for military use and they were going to be used, but they, they got there too late for the first world war. And so they, they didn't really come into use later. Um, and gangsters found them and it was like, oh, okay. Then law enforcement <laughs> had to ar arm themselves similarly to be able to keep up. But yeah, Dale didn't have access to that kind of weaponry, although he did have an extensive cache of weapons. He had, you know, handguns, shotguns, anything he could, you know, get his hands on. He liked guns and he liked cars. Well, Margie was no uh, slouch either with a gun and driving a getaway car, was she? No, actually, she was impressive. She could shoot <laughs> and drive. She oftentimes drove the getaway car, like for the bank robbery, a couple of bank robberies and stuff. She drove the getaway car. That was her job, but she was armed and it didn't, it, they were just, they were reckless, like you'd expect, because um, now we know teenage brains, sorry, teenagers, but teenage brains don't, aren't fully developed for quite a while. And so they sometimes lack impulse control. There's some things that are missing and that's just the way the brain works. And so you, we have these two people who already are adrenaline junkies and you arm them and you put them in a fast car for the time, they have no fear. They had absolutely no fear zero and that's why they got in so many sticky situations but also got out of them because they weren't afraid other people would have just thrown their hands up and go you know you're i'm done arrest me not them oh no no they just stayed on the run because they they really they just had no fear they didn't have the sense to have any fear wow that's just interesting uh psychology of these two individuals are yeah 
you know. Um, what is it, um, what made you interested in telling their story? I mean, uh, were you already familiar with their story from yeah, your other yeah, work? I, I was. Um, found it, um, uh, I work with, a, I work, well, when COVID's not going, I, I, I sometimes work with a, a tour bus company that gives crime tours of Los Angeles. And one of the tours that we gave was um, in the San Gabriel Valley, I think. And this, this story came up as one of the stories and it was just like oh wow this is great because this it is like you said it's bonnie and clyde decades before bonnie and clyde there was another bonnie and clyde sort of duo in la in the 30s and they got a lot of press but dale and margie you know again not so much although in the newspapers yeah heavily covered and then after they um after they died uh in a shootout of course um <laughs> How else were as they you know? as you would, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. And in fact, this is really interesting. Um, jumping ahead to that, but they do they do die in a shootout. But um, the, and they 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 kill uh, a police officer. It it's quite possible that Margie's was the fatal shot. And I've heard it through the grapevine. Um, so you know whatever my source is, but um, that it's quite possible that one of the uh, officers on the scene or someone else on the scene in law enforcement um, made sure that Margie died. Hmm. Which I have no problem with, given what she <laughs> was. But, um, it, you know, the law abiding side, us, us part of me is horrified. But the part of me that seeks justice in a, in a different way is kind of like, yeah, okay, you know, you made your bed. You know well, so it's the wages of sin, right? You know, yeah. you know what, you know, there's a price to pay. If you're going to, if you're going to play this game, there's a price. It's not free. You don't, you don't get to walk away free. Something happens. And yeah, but for, for quite a while afterwards, they were supposedly um, in possession of a great deal of money. And there were people that used to go through the hills, the hillsides, they allegedly <laughs> hid the stash in the hills but I don't believe that they had a stash. They were, they were people who spent money as soon as they got it, which is why they pulled so many jobs. They, they, and they were kids. As, so when they moved into this house in the LA area, they immediately went out and bought furniture and bought um, uh, a Victrola, you know, and records and all that. And, and so they bought all this stuff. So they never, they weren't saving for a rainy day. They knew that <laughs> their pension plan no no they were just they were just looking at what's going to happen in the next two minutes and this is going to be fun or not fun that's all we care about they're sort of like they're almost like uh, paramecium like one celled you know single celled organisms they have one <laughs> single thought and they pursue it and that's it they don't see a bigger picture there's no big picture for them no clearly not um well when you know, I uh, I don't know if you've uh, had a chance to read the other stories in the book, but I mean, there's there's so many different aspects to these relationships. I mean, sometimes you know, one person sort of sucks the other one in into yeah. this life of crime, or sometimes they're equally uh, involved with this. Um, as far as Margie and Dale are concerned, um, do you pretty much consider them as equal partners in crime, or do you see any signs that there may have been some coercion? Absolutely equal. Absolutely equal. I mean, um, yeah, absolutely equal. Margie had already been in trouble on her own before she ever met Dale. Uh, you know, petty stuff, but still, you know, and, and so she'd already been in trouble. And I, I think that what for them, it was just meeting their match, just meeting that kindred spirit, that person that sparks, you know, and, and for most of us, I think our best match is someone who brings out the best in us. <laughs> But for those two, it was, you know, brings out what they consider to be the best, but the worst for anybody else. They, you know, they took chances in each other's company. I think they had a dynamic that made them push each other further. You know, they had something to prove to themselves and something to prove to each other. And so their relationship, I think, was like that. But I, I consider them to be equals. Uh, she was not innocently duped by Dale, and he certainly wasn't innocently duped either. 
Wow. Yeah. I mean, there, there's some other uh, stories in the book as well that it's, that it's like that. But of course, um, since Margie and Dale were both killed, there's no way for them to finger point. Whereas uh, <laughs> other cases in the book, there was a lot of finger pointing saying, oh, no, 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 it wasn't uh -huh. me, it was him and yeah. that sort of a thing. Yeah, it's all fun and games until you get busted. Yeah, and then the and love goes out the window very fast. Oh, oh so fast. So <laughs> fast. And I don't know if these two would have sold each other out or not. I mean, when you you know when you look at cases before and since, that seems to be the tendency. But there are cases where they stand fast, and you know, so I'm not sure how it would have played out with them. I think because they had drug addictions and other you know other issues they're both wild cards so it's not I, I can't really i can't put my finger on if if one would tell on the other or not I, they certainly it's fun to speculate though it is and they certainly went down together i mean you know they knew they they had the the car sort of rigged for a firefight so they knew you know they were ready to shoot it out and that sort of um that's sort of a covenant of itself, isn't it? I mean, you're kind of saying when you outfit the car that way and you're both heavily armed, you're saying, yeah, I'm I'm willing I'm willing to die. Um, I'm willing to die in service of whatever we're doing. So extend that to, yeah, I'm willing to die for you. And I, I think, in, in, you know, I think they saw that as the romance part of it, you know. The, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose to them that would have been a, a, being young and and just that sort of that romantic. Yeah. You know, we'll go down in a blaze of gore, glory and a blaze of gunfire, and yeah. that's exactly what happened. Yeah, because Bonnie and Clyde. I mean, they, you know, they same thing. They were gonna they were gonna go, you know, together. And and she, you know, she she wrote she wrote into the newspaper. She wrote a poem. Bonnie did about you know, about they're not, you know, we don't think we're so tough and desperate. We know the law always wins, you know, and, and then that's where I got the wages of sin line. It was, you know, she was calling that and, and she, you know, that's, that was Bonnie Parker, but Bonnie Parker was, you know, I think her high school class valedictorian or something. And, and uh, Margie, no, I, I'm not sure that she finished school and, and Dale d definitely did not grammar school, I think is as far as he got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, were they they were both were they both from uh, poor backgrounds or or not? No, I don't remember. I mean, no, um, uh, Dale's background was a little dicey, but um, <laughs> but you know, I mean, not necessarily dirt, dirt poor, but certainly on the lower. But Margie's family, they there was a winery in there somewhere. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I don't think she was. Uh, I don't, and, you know, and her siblings seem not to have gotten in this kind of trouble. So I don't really know. Although I think one of her sisters did marry, was married to one of Dale's um, cohorts, one of his, oh. but I don't know if that happened before or after, I can't remember, but yeah. But I, I think Margie, again, I think she was basically a bad seed. I think you just, you know, you, you can have good parents, you can have a good upbringing and sometimes these these bad seeds just sort of spring fully formed. They're just, yeah. I, I believe, I believe in evil. I think, you know, I think that some people are just evil. That's it. Yes. And it, there is no, you can't necessarily explain it by anything that we can, you know, by any tangible means. They just are. And I think, the, I think those two were, I think they were just, they were just evil, you know, and they got to die young. <laughs> And, and they and they and they linked up and made more evil together. It's like a yeah, yeah they created explosion. Yeah. yeah, they're they're an interesting they're an interesting couple for sure. <laughs> well, I mean, you mentioned that obviously the the thrill factor was there. I mean, they were really getting off on this. This was fun. Oh. But I mean, um, all this stuff going on, presumably greed had to be a motivating factor as well. Well, they had to maintain the lifestyle that they wanted and that took money but they were mostly on the run i mean again like bonnie and clyde you know you get x amount of dollars and you have to pay it out to stay someplace or you have to pay if you're going to stay with somebody you probably have to buy their silence you know everything's going to cost you everything's going to cost you more than it would if you were on the up and up staying someplace is going to cost you um you can steal a car you still have to put gas in it you you know all these things are costly if you want to buy a new dress, you know, all these things. So they were, their cash 
then you know the in the intake of cash would the, the the outgo was just like i think much faster they you know they lived it up when they had it but it was you know sort of like feast or famine they they but like again like you said there wasn't any retirement plan in the making and in fact like i said i don't think their plans ever extended further than that day that afternoon and you know if they suddenly realized they were out of money they went and got money the you know the only ways they knew how to do it or the only ways they were interested in in doing it you know it almost sounds like um as far as the money motivating them it wasn't even that strong it was just like we're doing it because we can yeah, and because we was, like it it was the thrill it was the thrill i i i don't think I don't think anything would have stopped them. Prison didn't stop Dale, you know, and jail didn't stop him. He escaped from jail before. <laughs> and, and, you know, so he, I think at, for some of that, I think he felt invincible and, and, and you kind of do when you're a teenager anyway, you really don't see, you don't hear the clock ticking like you do when you get older. <laughs> they don't, you know, they didn't hear that. And, and so he, you know, he'd broken out of jail. He, and, they just they lived in the moment that's it that's all they that's all they had was right then right now and uh, you you were mentioning about dale being very cheeky and and uh that that one scene where he's like calling the cops up saying well i'm over here at the drugstore on the phone but i won't be when you get here and no and the cop arrives and the phone's off the hook and there and it's just dangling <laughs> it's it's clear that dale wasn't you know he was telling the truth he really was there and that's another thing that's the whole part of the thrill aspect for it is like a guy who's really trying to get away isn't going to call the police and you know <laughs> harass them or, or goad them. I'm and here. Hi. Hey, guess what? Here I am over here. No, I'm over there. It, they're not going to do that. If you really are serious about getting away, you're going to slip away under cover darkness, or you know, you're not going to make a big scene about it. But he liked to just you know stick the knife in and twist it, and it made him feel powerful. And it yeah. made him feel, you know, and I think that was a lot of it too. The the, the gun, the fast car, um, and just uh, thumbing his nose at at law enforcement made him feel made him feel tough, made him feel like a big man, and so all that stuff. And because he wasn't, he was kind of um, like I said, he had a baby face, and he did dress as a woman before. <laughs> And, and so I think that, I think in order to somehow prove his toughness, sometimes he went out of his way to show, you know, I'm a badass. I can, you know, I can call the police and, you know, and, and mock them and, you know, say, come and get me if you dare. And I think that's just part of his character. Well, I can imagine this must have really uh, st stuck in the craw of the police with this guy constantly doing this to them. You know, it's yeah. like they can't get him, or if they get him, he's gone like five minutes later. No, they hated him, and rightfully so. I mean, he was a cop killer, and eventually, he was going. So what happened to him was going to happen, and for for that, for being a cop killer. You know, they're, they're, I've written about people, you probably have too. I've written about people, very few, but I've written about some people for who I feel some empathy. I can see how they got where they did. You know, I may not like it. I still think they need to pay a price, but I can, I can see it. I can, I can see that it's sort of, you know, there, but for the grace, that kind of thing. Like, oh, okay, I get that. But with Dale, no, I really don't see it at all. Again, I just think he was born bad. And for me, the real heroes, of course, in the story are the are the cops who, you know, chase him and and they finally get him and they should have that the way he went, the way he needed to go. No two ways about it in my mind. And there was just no other there was no other out for him. He was not going to ever become a respectable citizen. He and Margie were not going to settle down and God <laughs> forbid raise a family. Can you imagine <laughs> if that would have turned out to be? And so I think that, you know, for him, I don't, I don't feel any empathy. I'm in, I, I'm surprised and shocked by the things that he did sometimes. I mean, even though I, you know, we've written about, heard about, read about murder, bank robbery and all that before, but it's still, I never want it to lose the ability to shock me. Yeah. And it still does. It's still, it's sort of like, how can you do that? How can, especially in the case where, you know, where you're taking a life, how can you do yeah. that? 
then how how do you get up you know how do you get up the next day and look at yourself with anything that even resembles respect and for someone like that that's what makes them feel respect self-respect is that those activities and for me it just makes them you know lower than dirt i i just he's not anyone i feel any empathy for or margie either they you know not 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 one bit Mm -mm. Was Margie, uh, did she uh, kill or was Dale more so doing a lot of the killing or most of it? Um, I think he had more opportunity. But again, I think it it, it, I, I, it may have been her bullet that ended uh, one of the deputy sheriff's lives at the end. So um, she would not have hesitated. Mm. She, she would have certainly have killed. And I, I think, you know, if she didn't, if in some of these situations, um, especially then, even with um, even with some ballistics and stuff, you can't always prove who fired what shot. I mean, right? Some of these are just firefights, and it could be a, you know. So um, she did. I, I feel she killed. Whether it you know can be established as 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 fact or not, I believe she did. She certainly had. Um, she certainly had the inner whatever it takes that that disconnect from the rest of humanity than it takes to take a life. She had that. She had that. She never would have hesitated because she she fired out from the from a move from a car when they were being pursued by police. So she knew who she was shooting at and she yeah. was trying to stop them. So she, she, she'd kill without a doubt and, and not, I don't think, feel a moment regret for it. The only thing she feel, I think, would be um, elated that they escaped and maybe um, a small uh, notch on her you know belt. That's what I think. Quite a pair, quite a pair. <laughs> really. Um, we were mentioning earlier that um, your, your your thing is really historical true crime, and, and uh, that's your love. Um, yes. How how would you say historical true crime is relevant to today's reader? Uh, I mean, when I'm when I'm selecting for the anthologies, you know, sometimes I'll, I mean, I always make sure I get in at least you know include at least one or two historical yeah. ones, you know. But but I know like personally, I'm not a history buff, so I, you got to watch that it's it's not going to be too dry and draggy yeah. and whatnot. But I mean, what? Do, how would you justify this uh, historical true crime uh, being something that today's reader should be interested in reading about? Well, crimes don't change; people don't change. I mean, the, the, you can you can relate it to things that you know that happen now. I mean, there's only a few historical crimes. Um, I find them more interesting in a lot of ways because, frankly, they had to be more imaginative. They, they were just. <laughs> They, you know, when, when was the last time you read about a trunk murder? <laughs> right? I mean, there's all kinds of things it, it, to me, but people don't change. I mean, people are still, they're still bad. They're still good. So th the history part is just the setting of it. You know, it adds, and, and for, for um, when you're looking at it, especially when you're looking at a case from the law enforcement perspective, you know, which I try to think of a lot of times, they didn't have the tools that that police have today is still a good a good detective still worth his or her weight in gold without a doubt the science is nothing without good police work it just you know it just it's just another tool but yeah. then what they had was primitive by our standards today and uh so they really they had to the, the cops had to really be at the top of their game and i'm always surprised to this day, by some of the cases they were able to solve with with what they had to work with, it's amazing, and I think that never gets old. I don't think that I think people are always as fascinated because I always think of myself as sort of like Joan every person, and I think if it interests me, it'll probably interest other people too. And the history part of it, it's just for me, it's just kind of nice because I love the history, I love crime in black and white. That's how I see it. It's film noir in my head. It's yeah. black and white. That's how it happens. And and so there's that. You can separate yourself from it too. You're really more of a um, an observer in some respects. You can you can distance yourself. This is a crime that happened in you know 1919. <laughs> You know, and these people are, they'd be dead from natural causes by now if they hadn't been, you know, shot to death. But the history part of it, to me, just gives it that extra layer of interest. 
and and a way to it's a way to time travel like like you know if i could be like in star trek if someone could you know the holodeck if someone could put me in that and send me back in time for for a while and interact i'd be i'd be one happy person so for me it's a way to time travel i make the time machine i get in it i'm able to see la the way i want to see it the way it was you know and i get to see people dressed the way i love to see them dressed <laughs> And the crimes are the same. It's still, and the, and the motives are the same. Greed, lust, you know, uh, rage, all the stuff that causes people to murder now. And it's the same, but it's just, they're dressed in different clothes and their <laughs> manners are different. And, and the police work is just simply astonishing. And we have a lot of um, pioneers in forensic science um, in LA, for sure I know about, that really paved the way for for the future which, which is where we are now their future and it's i'm fascinated i can't help but think other people would be too that's a wonderful um description of it i mean that that's so true and and um and and also like i said highlighting um the police work and how with what today would be primitive methods and they were still able to do as much as they did oh there is they're amazing i mean they actually they they, they door knocked people, you know, looking for stuff or clues. They had to put the things together. They had to be, and they still have to be. I know some homicide investigators and in the sheriff's department, um, LA County Sheriff's Department, and a couple of them I know pretty well. And they, they have that, that you could put them, you could take them and put them in that time machine and send them back. And they'd still be fantastic detectives because they know how to read people, they know how to talk to people, you know, because you have to, you, there's, there's a different approach for different suspects, I think, and they know how to talk to them. Like one of, two of my friends were the lead detectives on the Night Stalker case, Richard Ramirez in the 1980s. And they each are, they're very different men, very different personalities, and they had their own interview styles. And the way they approached the case was phenomenal and the way they interviewed the suspect was phenomenal they each had their own style and they each but it, but he was aware the suspect richard was aware of both of them he knew who they were and it was it's really interesting but you could take either of those guys or any of the people i know in homicide and put them in that time machine and they would they would just crush it they'd be fantastic <laughs> with or without the science because they know they understand people they understand people and they know they have, how they have the nose they do and they know how to get them to talk a friend of mine i introduced him to one of these guys he that both the friends are police my my friend was is a retired um from lapd and i introduced him to my friend in homicide and the sheriff's department because they it was a project a book something and uh, he wanted to the lapd guy wanted to interview the sheriff's guy and when we left i said what did you think and the lapd guy said oh my god God, I can see why he is such a phenomenal investigator. He said, I found myself wanting to tell him stuff. And that, <laughs> that's not that guy. He doesn't, he doesn't open up really easily. And I said, it's amazing, isn't it? He said, yeah, I understand now why he's such a great investigator. Cause you know, he's never met a stranger. He, he's a big, physically a big man, but he puts you right at ease. And, you know, you just feel like, you know, like he could just put a friendly arm around you and just talk to you. And that's how he get. And he just gets right in there. And it's genius. And that's his. Not everybody has the same style. They're all different. But it's amazing to me. And I that when I look at law enforcement in the past, it's the same thing. I have a couple of favorite investigators from the past whom <laughs> I love. And um, they just they were just that good. They knew how to talk to people and they knew how to put together a puzzle. And that's what it takes. The science is great. The science is really helps things along. And a lot of these cold cases now, you know, I've met some cold case investigators and um, as a lot of it's based on the science. Now they can run stuff that they couldn't run, you know, 40 years ago when the, you know, when, when, when whatever happened, happened. So that's amazing. But Still, investigators are, I think they're just uh, the same across history. They have that, they have something, it's, it's, I think, um, it's not, it's a calling, 
it's like people are called to it. And I think that, so I think people have a, a tendency to self-select it for the right reasons. You know, people can go into a lot of stuff for the wrong reasons, but I think if you're working homicide, you're probably there for the right reasons. Yeah, that would, would be for everyone, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. Oh, that's really cool. Um, well, um, again, just for those who have been listening, just to uh, uh, mention Joan's story is The Wages of Sin, The Ballad of Margie and Dale. Um, and they were uh, before Bonnie and Clyde and uh, just as hardcore as Bonnie and Clyde, perhaps even more so. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely were. They really were. I mean, they're fascinating people. Like I said, I don't like them very well, but they're fascinating people. And I well, like we don't necessarily people. like the people we're writing about in no, true crime, no, right? Especially like know. serial killers and <laughs> most of the time I find them absolutely, you know, despicable, reprehensible human beings. But they're still, I, you know, I think I think that's what draws a lot of women to true crime. Um, as readers and as writers as well. I mean, I think we have that, we want to know what makes them tick thing. Yes. You know, what makes their wheels turn around? I think for a lot of, some men too, but I think a lot of the men are like the adventure, the, you know, the, the shootouts. I'm into that too. I mean, for me, uh, I'm, a good movie has a high body count, not, <laughs> not puffy sleeves. If it's puffy yeah, sleeves, I am the same. Not, high body count, I'm interested. But I think that women have a tendency to really want to know, you know, what, why, you know, why is that? And there's a lot of, you know, there's studies that, you know, like women are into true crime because they want to find out ways to avoid becoming a victim and because they want to find out what makes these people tick. Could I be in that situation? Could I do that thing? Could someone I know do that thing? Uh, we're just curious about that stuff. And I think that's why a lot of women are in it. Yeah, good point. Good point. Um, are you working on any new projects you'd like to mention? I know you have a, a, a book contract that, and you're yeah. diligently. <laughs> I am. It's more history, and it, it it it's going to be. There's no there's no title yet, but the the subject matter is Los Angeles during the Prohibition era. Oh. And for me, I'm taking the Prohibition era. I mean, the Volstead Act came in like 1920, but Los Angeles um, started having their own, they, they went dry in advance, like 1917, I think. And so for me, prohibition in LA starts in about 1917 and goes to 1939 when um, uh, a very corrupt mayor, Frank Shaw, was actually recalled in a recall election and he was forced to leave office because of it. And for me, that sort of puts the end to to the prohibition era, even though the Volstead Act was over by 1933, the, all these things, it was like a train rolling downhill. It, it just picked up momentum and just kept going. And I think for me, that's that that's that the period is, is 1917 to 1939 for LA. And so I'm looking at a bunch of different stories because there's, there's definitely a character to the time period. You, when you mention prohibition to people, they instantly get different images yeah. in their heads, you know? Um, Flappers uh, and 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 uh, machine guns. Yeah, with, gangsters and the, the side yeah. the, the, of the we car. And, gangsters in the same way that they had them in, let's say, Chicago, Kansas City, or or New York. But L.A. had its own sort of top-down structure for um, uh, for taking people's money. It mostly it mostly emanated from city hall down into the street. So the usually the you know the bad actors were in in city hall and they sort of pulled the strings for everything else there was uh, an interesting symbiotic relationship there but yeah it, it's i think it's a fascinating period of time no matter where you look at it and the whole build up to prohibition was decades and decades i mean they started talking about dry stuff in the 1760s or something so you know it's really interesting to see how this you know and i can understand it i, I can understand because women were really in favor of um, dry because alcohol, from a woman's point of view, for a lot of years was the reason for um, spousal abuse. You know, the drunk husband comes home, beats the kids, beats beats his wife, beats, and um, and uh, monetary. You know, guy loses his job over drink. And when women's 
fates were more tied to, you know, economic to their mate. It, that was tough. And so I can see why a lot of women were in favor of, you know, getting rid of alcohol, but people being yeah. what they are, uh, drinking or no drinking, they're still jerks sometimes. So, I mean, it, it, you're hoping for a utopia and what you get is still people behaving like people. Well, this sounds like a fascinating uh, book and um, I, I wish you the best of luck with it and I'm sure it'll be great. Um, oh, thank you're, you. I've also got you on the schedule with, um, you're going to be in the book that comes out after this one, which is the uh, Unsolved Crimes and yeah. Mysteries book. And that's already up for pre-order and that's coming out in September in Yay. 2022. This is 2022, right? Yeah, <laughs> this coming September. Yeah, oh, perfect. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 I love those. I love those, the, the ones where that, you know, yeah, I'm still, I'm just, I got to go uh, just give the manuscript one more read to look for any sneaky errors and then deliver. I got a couple of blurbs I'm waiting on and then I'll be yeah. shipping that off at the end of this month or by March 1st is my deadline. Uh, so well, I'll tell you one thing for sure. <laughs> on to the next one. <laughs> I, I have, I'll tell you what, no, there's no writer who doesn't need an editor and you are really a good one. Oh, thank you. I mean, seriously. Yeah. Cause I, it, it's just, it's sort of like you you look at the version you turn in and even if it's you know even if it's pretty much the same when you get it back from the editor there's just those subtle things that you pick up that make all the difference in the world and it's like whoa you mean i wrote that how cool is that <laughs> <laughs> i'm a better writer than i thought what you are is a, a decent writer with a really good editor <laughs> i'm a big fan of, there's a couple of groups of people i love editors librarians <laughs> yeah there's just these groups. I love these people. So, yeah. Well, okay. yeah. I mean, you know, I try to be, uh, uh, you know, as an editor, you know, I don't want to change someone's story. I mean, I, we've all heard horror stories of authors who get their, like, you know, if they're working with an editor at a publishing house and the editor, want, you know, is coming up with stuff that's like, well, that's yeah. not my book anymore. And that's yeah. not really, you know. No. Editing is so much. It's sort of like, it's like the difference between you know, hitting someone over the head with a hammer and using a scalpel to carefully dissect bits. You know, I, I like the scalpel approach. It's really precise. It's it's intentional. You know, it's not just a wham. You know, I'll just blow the whole thing up and you know, it really. <laughs> well, you see, though, that's the thing. I mean, because I'm a writer, I'm I already have that. I mean, a lot of yeah. editors. I I don't know. If, can you be an editor if you're not a writer? Because perhaps that's where the problem lies. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. I think no offense to editors out there, but I mean, it's no, like I mean, if you haven't gone gone and actually you, done the actual putting the words and creating with the yeah. words, then I think uh, there are some some readers, some people who are really. Um, judicious and careful and aware readers can probably be editors without having to be writers. But I think that I don't know how often that happens. It, it's a particular skill and I certainly don't have it. And it's just, I didn't know I had it either. It just sort of <laughs> happened <laughs> like, oh, you know, like, Hey, yeah, you know, I'm actually pretty damn good at this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And, and I'll tell you, it makes it, it again, it makes all the difference in the world from, you know, it just really does. It, it's it's a great thing. <laughs> well, Editor, I appreciate Edward, that. Props. I appreciate that. I mean, I've had a few other people who have been in my books say that, and I'm sure some listeners are thinking, oh, what is she like sending them checks to say all these good things? <laughs> no, no, believe me, if I didn't think hey, it, I wouldn't, say it. No, I wouldn't say it. No, I have very little filter between here and my mouth. So <laughs> you might have noticed. And so, you know, if, if it's not, if I'm not actually thinking it, there's a downside to that too, which is obvious, but. <laughs> well, listen, is John, thank you. I, I, it's been great talking to you. And uh, okay. again, your story, uh, The Wages of Sin, The Ballad of Margie and Dale, an incredible, fascinating story, uh, oh, cool. historical piece of gangsters in early 20th century USA. How could it be any better? <laughs> That's what I think. <laughs> so again, the book, uh, The Best New True Crime Stories, Partners in Crime, out we now. We are here in our partner, partner. Yep, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, just like there we are. We'll just, we'll just go out. We'll just pin the book to the front of us and take walks around the neighborhood. What well, makes you think I haven't already done that? <laughs> <laughs> hey, why? Whatever sells a book, I'm happy. I'm in.
<laughs> Thanks again for joining me. And um, pleasure, I'll you probably so see you soon on some other stuff we're, we're, we're cooking up. We Yes, you will. Yeah, if you'll have me, I'll be there. <laughs> okay, I won't be able to get rid of you. <laughs> I'm afraid not. <laughs> scraping the bottom of your shoe comes from that's that. it once you got joan that's it she's there forever <laughs> <Like a barnacle. laughs> well i appreciate you being on here barnacle joan <laughs> okay my pleasure missy thank you so much for having me take thanks care thanks everyone for listening bye. and watching <laughs> <laughs> bye bye